Welcome to GradCast, the official podcast of the Society of Graduate Students at the University of Western Ontario. Hello everybody and welcome to GradCast, the official radio show of the Society of Graduate Students here at Western University. I'm your host, Alex Mozinski, and today I am joined by Tyson Davis and Tristan Johnson. Hi, hi, hi. It's just the three of us in the booth today. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing well, thanks for asking. How are you? Pretty good. Not too bad. Partner is uh, graduating tomorrow, fin- defending her PhD. Go, Kelly. I know you're not listening right now. Go, but Kelly. Yeah. Congratulations, Kelly. Go for it. Rock it. Anyway, um, so for those of you who are regular listeners, uh, you'll be sad to know that today is our last live episode with Tyson. How do you feel, Tyson? Uh, kind of mixed emotions. I'm happy to be uh, going home, but I'm sad to be going home, I guess. It's both uh, a good and a bad thing all at once, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear that. Um, well, it's been great having you, and, you know, the next couple of weeks you'll still be around, so I better darn well see you. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> so, long story, you're going back to the Atlantic Island? Back to the Rock, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. How do so, you feel about... Uh, like, it's going to be like at the end of The Lord of the Rings, you know, you're coming back to the, to the Shire, and <laughs> you've seen these horrible sights and these huge cities and mountains. Come, mountains. I'm excited to see mountains again, because let me tell you, Ontario does not have mountains. Yeah, Ontario's like the Shire, if anywhere is. Yeah. I don't know, like, I'm talking about like, all the little towns, all the little fishing villages. <laughs> as I assume. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's pretty much it, right? Like, I, as you guys know, the town I'll be moving back to where my parents live has somewhere around 200 people. And no cell phone reception, apparently. And no cell phone reception. We just discussed this. Yeah, yeah that's supposed to be changing soon, but... Drive into we'll town see. for your daily text messaging. Well, yeah, you have to, we, it's funny because we know the exact spot. You have to drive about two, two and a half kilometers from my house, and there's a spot that once you pass that spot, you get cell phone service again. You, you know what? If I was an entrepreneurial person, you could consider this. That would be the best place to set up like a coffee shop. Ah. At that spot. Maybe five I years like ago. it, Tristan. I like <laughs> it. I, I know that Burlington was, because uh, I had shoddy cell phone service at my house too, and they were going to build a tower, and they actually had like a petition happen because the people in my suburb actually were like, we don't want a cell phone tower. It's going to give us brain cancer or something. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, gosh. No. Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, just one quick question. Is there any way that you can, like, climb a tree or something and, like, hold your phone up high to get reception? Or is it, like, so far it's, that height doesn't help? So it's it's is kind of height? a mixture. Like, I'm down in, like, we're right down on the water inside this cove, right? So we're sheltered on both sides by hills, like, to both enter or leave the cove in either direction. You Titan have to cove. go down a hill to enter and climb a hill to leave. So it's actually really strange because if you continue driving through my town and keep going to the other towns that are further down, cell phone service returns. So, like, we're the only town in this string of, like, ten towns along the coastline that doesn't have service. So... Uh, I don't think there's quite high enough you can climb. I've climbed some pretty high things there and never got cell phone service. Darn, I was trying to help you. I know some people get (laughs) these, like, big, crazy antennas from, like, Costco and stuff that they can hook up to their cell phone that do provide better service. Super, like, lightsaber antenna. Yeah, but then you have to have a cell phone that you can actually attach an antenna to. Like, as far as I know, there's no antenna I can attach to an iPhone. Yeah. Or is there? (laughs) dun 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 (laughs) <laughs> anyway, um, so kind of as a homage to the fact that you'll be going back to Newfoundland. Um, I like that you just said that right as well. Congratulations. Did I say it right? You said it right, yeah. How did I say it? Newfoundland, the right way. Most people say Newfoundland oh, that aren't from there, right? Get it right, people. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, be- because you'll be going back there, and something big happened there um, on August 1st, and that is that they're, they've switched from loans for post-secondary education, kind of like uh, OSAP is here in Ontario, to a non-repayable grant. Um, so that's kind of cool. So what? Yeah, what that's is, huge. That's what you, been there's been a, a movement in that for new for, in Newfoundland for years. Like when I was an undergrad from 2002 to I think it was 2006 or seven, I can remember going to two or three rallies where we, you know, with the CFS union, where we would. Um, petition the local government to freeze our tuition rates so they wouldn't increase. 
So mo I think almost the entirety of my undergraduate degree had frozen tuition rates. So it was exactly the same from 2002 all the way to the end, which was great. In comparison to here, I paid a little under 1500 a term for my tuition, and that included all of my fees, everything. That was my, I was paid to go to school for a term. So the Canadian Federation of Students out in Newfoundland is doing something right. Yes, yes, and they <laughs> have been for a while. I, I, I kind of credit it uh, somewhat to Danny Williams because he was a big part. He was um, very involved with that. He supported all of those movements greatly. So with his support as well, when he was premier, we really got stuff done. Okay. You're getting on debt free. Yeah, getting on. So how long was it frozen for prior to this shift toward uh, grants? So um, I can't say this with 100% um, certainty, but my entire undergrad, tuition rates never changed. And they were supposed to, every year it was, oh, tuition's going up 5% this year, and then a rally would happen, and then they'd be frozen and not go up. So at least in that five-year span, they didn't move from the less than 1500 a term. Wow. Yeah. Do you think this will give them reason to inflate the tuitions a little bit now, or...? I don't know. Like, we've been so long, um, like, fighting the good fight kind of thing to keep the tuition prices low that I think it, even if this completely switches over and it's completely grant-based and no, um, no loans anymore at all, I still think people would rally like crazy if they were like, well, now we can double it. Like, I think people would get very upset with that. I think that would bode well. Yeah. This evokes a lot of memories because, like, I was doing my undergrad at Bishop's uh, in Quebec, when, if you guys remember, the whole Red Square movement was going on. Now, Bishop's, because it was like the Anglo University, because like the tuition hike that was being planned wasn't being planned for out-of-province students. It was for in-province students, because they have really cheap tuition. And so, because Bishop's was like 60% out-of-province people, mm -hmm. we didn't have that much activism. But there was other universities, and everything was going on. It seems like maybe... We're the exceptions here in Ontario where when we get our tuitions hiked, we just kind of take it. Yeah. And when, like, like maybe, if anything, Newfoundland should be inspirational to us because what's going on is we need to be fighting for our rights as students because Ontario has the most expensive universities in the country and also has some of the most aggressive student loans. And I, it's... It, I'm always so inspired because, like, one of the easiest things an Ontarian can do is say, oh, look at these people complaining. They have it so – they're complaining about something that they have so well. And it's like, well, maybe they have it so well because they fight for it. And, um, yeah. So question to both of you guys who are having gone to universities where people successfully fought inflation. Um, what do those rallies look like? Because when I was in my undergrad at U of T – there would actually be massive rallies out in front of Convocation Hall where there would probably, be, I'm going to say hundreds, if not thousands of people would be there screaming with signs and megaphones and, I don't know, the cops would just show up and try to disperse it. So and that, that happened pretty much every year. Um, so what was different about what they did at your institution? So I can say in my experience, the, um, the rally would often start on campus, but it would turn into a big walk down to this government building that was about a kilometer away, and the protest would go on kind of outside the government building. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very peaceful for the most part. Like, there was never any violence as far as I know. Um, but it was in front of that government building, and, and it, it's similar to your story. You say hundreds, if not thousands. I'll say hundreds of people from the university would show up, from a campus that only has 1,500 students. So the turnout percentage was massive. Like, it was um, a very big turnout, and I think that's why the pressure was so high for them to freeze tuition. Okay. Yeah. I was in the student government. Like, I was, like, a senator uh, when this was going on. And the one thing I remember doing is that it created an extremely large gap uh, uh, a friendship gap between those who came from families that had money and those that didn't. And because you had to come from families that were able to support you through the summer to do the government stuff correctly, it was mostly people in the government were pretty unsupportive of the Red Square movement. And I remembered I had to burn a lot of bridges and get in a lot of trouble in my job there because one of the things I had to do was reiterate to them over and over again that they were playing these tu tuition hikes for our Quebecois students, which were 40% of the students. And also, um, 
this is one of the few opportunities that a Quebecois person might have to pay the tuition rate that they can afford, but also get an English university experience and learn how to learn to speak um, English fluently. And so I was just saying all the time that, you know, every penny you raise tuition, you are closing the door for somebody, for a student. And I think that for people who come from lucky backgrounds like myself, like a lot of the people that I worked with, it, it's really hard, and it's really hard to, underst- or to understand that 5% is big, especially when you are counting all of your pennies, especially when you are working for your tuition. Um, I know people who had to work for their whole tuition, but also they had to take semesters off because they just couldn't afford their tuition. So they had to do a year and then take a year off to be able to afford the next year. And it's it's really tragic that your choices are between massive debt that's going to haunt over me and many others for a whole lot of time and turning into a gigantic bubble that we really have to worry about, the student debt bubble. But also you're dealing with, or you have to deal with poverty and you have to uh, fight for, or you have to deal with these increasing tuitions. And so I understand the anger. I understand the the motivation and I think that the the moving to a grant, while it doesn't solve all of the problems, does have one really great benefit, and that is the fact that you're starting your young people off with degrees that push them ahead, because I don't think the university degree rate is as high in Newfoundland as it is in the average country. I wouldn't imagine it is. So, no. so having a university degree in Newfoundland is probably worth a lot. The, the problem in Newfoundland, at least for the last few years, has been jobs. The, the, like we're seeing it more in Ontario now, but we were seeing it in Newfoundland five years ago. Like, so I grew up, as you guys know, in this little town, but I grew up next to a city of probably 25,000 people. And there were only really three different like, major jobs you could get. You could work at a univers- the university in the city, you could work at the hospital in the city, or you could work at the pulp and paper mill in the city. Otherwise, you were going to get, maybe you could get a job at a bank or something, but otherwise, the majority of jobs were minimum wage jobs. So people, at least in in that city, if you didn't get a university education, you stayed in the city. People who did get a university education, for the most part, left. So the this, province of the city. The, uh, it could be one or both, right? Okay. A lot of people would go to St. John's because there was more opportunity, or just completely leave, come to Toronto, come to Brampton, come to London, go out out west even further. Like my sister moved to Alberta to, yeah, to find the employment. Whole, uh, what's what's it say? Saint Agathe? No. Um, that's that's in Quebec. What's the city called? Fort Mac. Yeah, Fort Fort McMurray. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Because th- there's jokes that Fort McMurray is the uh, the largest Newfoundland city. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the job problem is is one of the big criticisms that I was reading about this whole thing. That people are saying, yeah, it's great. You're helping to alleviate the debt, but the problem is you're they're doing it in part to help try to retain educated people in the population. Yeah. And the big criticism, one of them anyway, is that they don't think that's going to be effective because there's still no jobs for those educated people you've created. So they're still going to move out west um, somewhere in the country because the whole country is west of there. Um, and and in that case, it it isn't really going to help. It's going to help them get a leg up, but it's not necessarily going to help the province. Yeah, it, it, and I've read similar criticisms that it will help the person and not the economy of the province. Um, that being said, in the last, say, year or two, a lot of big things have started happening in Newfoundland. A lot of big um, industry development has started happening. So uh, some of the fr- my friends that I did undergrad with are now becoming, you know, uh, I forget the exact word for it, but there's a an acronym for it, but like oil, power, technology, engineering, there's an acronym for it that I don't remember. Um, but a lot of my friends have done that because there were a few new oil reserves discovered that they're building for right now. So there will be a fairly big boom of jobs happening in the next year or two, um, or I say even the next five years, but that wasn't the case five years ago. And so a lot of people, most of the people I went to high school with, if they stayed in Newfoundland, they're working minimum wage, or they got lucky enough to get one of the few jobs home, they became a nurse or something, got one of the few jobs that exists that pays good money, or they became electricians, carpenters, engineers, and just left for Alberta. I I think that also they're not thinking, the people who make these kind of criticisms aren't thinking in the long term. Uh, I see a lot of, first of all, even if, say, half the people leave, right, the half people who stay behind are starting their careers with either no or less debt. 
that means that they have more of a personal income. What does that mean for Newfoundland? That means maybe maybe it might not help the job thing right away, but what it does do is it means you have more money to buy a house. You have more money to invest in the economy. You have more money to buy food and all of these things. And so you're starting off on a higher leg. You're spending more money because you're not forking over so much of your personal wealth to debtors. Yeah, and that will encourage more businesses to mm-hmm. pop up. Yeah. The other thing is recidivism. Like, people who might leave for a while, they will go off because a lot of people, Newfoundlanders will get this uh, grant-based thing and start off with less debt, have a more prosperous life. They might leave the province, but a lot of them will either be giving money to family at home or they might move home later, like in retirement or something. Yep. And all sorts of things. Like this, it, it's a really great idea. Like a, it, it's, I mean, it seems like so many times when you have an economics debate, it always goes back to like laissez-faire versus Keynesian economics. And the people complaining are doing a laissez-faire based thing. It's like we're spending all this money and like we're, go- we're not going to do anything. And it's like, think of it Keynesian. You're putting money into the system that people are going to spend. Not money that's won't. going to be sat on, like if you gave it to, say, like a factory owner or something. If you're, this is money that every that is going to get 100% spent, and it's going to be spent on s- Newfoundland products. That then means businesses can grow, and also it, it, it's you just have to think long term, I suppose. Yeah, and from the I, I spent some time before the show today, um, just googling around different web pages, looking for information on this story, looking for people's comments, and most of the negative comments I saw. Um, regarding this were I don't want to pay extra taxes so somebody can go get for instance this was one comment I saw a visual arts degree Mm. so it seems like people are very focused on you know yeah sure give people grants but only give them grants for um, programs that they can stay in Newfoundland to do a lot of people were like get rid of the courses at universities that are purely intellectual and if that was the case like everything I've done in university for the most part has been just an intellectual exercise. And I did math. You know, that is arguably one of the most important um, parts of science. Without uh, at least some understanding of math, you can't really do science. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's important that we keep that distinction. Like we were talking about in our last, I guess, our podcast that will be coming out tonight. tonight. Um, We were talking about jobs for graduate students, and one of the comments that we made was if you... Get, if you make entirely university education based on getting and keeping jobs, then you're getting rid of the original function of what universities were it's supposed and to what they are, which is supposed education. to be a safe haven for free thought and to move forward intellect. Um, and so it's supposed to be a place where professors can think about things that aren't necessarily going to make industry billions of dollars. They're supposed to be things that could potentially help humanity yes, um, exactly. over and time and not necessarily for money. And this became an issue for me when I was you know, going through my PhD, trying to apply for grants, applying for NSERC and OGS and things like this. How is my research relevant to the world? How, what applications does it have that will help the world? And I had this kind of cooked up answer that I used in everyone. By the way, never got any of them because I guess they recognize this cooked up answer as something that they don't give money to. But without advancement in math, physics can't advance and chemistry can't advance and ultimately all of science can't advance without mathematicians laying the original groundwork. Like, you know, how, how did physics work if not for the invention of calculus, you know? So, so just like these loans, it's a long-term benefit that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Everybody should know that. I also I also think that people like those kind of criticisms also uh, don't understand the the side effects of education that aren't just the literal. Like as, as I said in the podcast, you were kind of paraphrasing what I said, where it was like these investments are not just in uh, like an, a fine arts BA is not just uh, you're not just learning how to paint. You know, uh, first of all, I should say that people in fine arts I have found to be some of the hardest working people ever because they know it's a tough field and they know that they got to try their butts off to yeah. really get themselves uh, known. Yeah, because there was fine arts in my, in, at the university where I did my undergrad and they had so much competition, even just gaining entrance to the program. Yeah. 
I had friends in the fine arts program like working until like four or five in the morning yep. at the studio painting and everything like that. But besides that, university trains you on other things besides. There's a lot. Uh, there's an entire industry of people uh, who work with university degrees and are doing nothing even close to what they studied. But the fact that they went through the university system, they learn how to write, they learn how to think, they also learn how to work, they learn how to manage their time, all of those things that high school should teach you but doesn't, and that makes them more efficient, more well-rounded workers. And that leads them to jobs where they take management roles, where they take leadership, where they take initiative. And that is the value of an educated person, even if what you were driven and working on was sculpting or photography. And arguably, for, for all the people that kind of think, oh, well, we'll give these grants to people, but only the people who are going to come out with like a title where they can get a job with that title and continue to contribute to the province, that's what colleges and vocational schools are for. Like, if you want to become an electrician or a carpenter or any, like, proper trade, there's, there's something like three or four different colleges in the city where you can go and do that. I'm assuming this will apply to that, too. What's that? I, I'm assuming that this grant will apply to them, too. I would assume as well, yeah. Which is good, because having more people in those types of professional degrees would also be a direct short-term benefit, because, you know, if you're a hotel manager, there's hotels in the Newfoundland, so you yeah. can... Um, you can have a, like like you're directly benefiting the economy there because then you're not going into debt to become a hotel manager. So. And I know for like from I, so I never went through the colleges. Of course, I'm you know still here in university. But um, from what I know, a lot of my friends that did go through, um, it was actually uh, financially a better decision than going to university because they often do um, like apprenticeship style programs. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the electrician program you do, it's either two or three years when you start, and then you leave and you, you become a first year apprentice and get paid to work while you're doing it. Then you go back to a little more, become a second year apprentice until finally you graduate to the journeyman, the full blown electrician. Yep. So the entire time they're going through school, they're getting like these work term placements that is making the money to pay for the next term. So like a co-op term at Waterloo, I know they have that program. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But they get one, like, something like every year. They every do semester. Yeah. yeah, they do, like, a term of work, and then they do, like, a one year of apprenticeship, and then another term of work, and then one year of apprenticeship. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm probably just speculating on the long-term forecast that Newfoundland wants to have for its economy. But I imagine that they're, like, a lot of the country, especially Newfoundland, actually, where they want to move out of, say, the resource extraction economy so they want less miners in your case fishermen or uh or what whatever you know whatever else you do oil uh, technology is pretty uh, big home like oil so, drilling for oil and you want they want to move into the secondary economy they want to move to making things or to um to servicing things and you need skilled people for that you don't you and you need infrastructure and business and all sorts of stuff around it because you know you're your white collar worker doesn't uh, isn't isn't happy to just log in his 14 hours and then go home and go to sleep. Like there's like you have to build up an entire infrastructure around them, and so these uh, moving away from resource extraction is in the long term very good, especially because we can't rely on. I mean, Newfoundland had show saw it was like everyone seeing what happens when you rely too much on one resource for too long. Uh, the, the sad part of the Newfoundland story. It's getting better. Yep, yep. Well, I mean, then now it's... Uh, so I probably told you guys the story, but last winter uh, it was so cold that all of the um, electricity generating facilities got kind of overpowered and they ha started having to do rolling blackouts in the middle of, like, December to alleviate the strain. And rolling blackouts in minus 20, minus 25 is not exactly good. Like, I had a close friend living in Cornerbrook at the time, and he lost his power for something like eight hours and had to leave. He told me he left his house when he could start to see his breath inside his own house. He had to leave his house. So it would definitely be good to keep those kind of people in Newfoundland to improve our energy generation technologies and things like this. I remember in grade five, one of the topics in social studies was the brain drain. And it was exactly this conversation we're having about people becoming highly educated Newfoundland and then just leaving, finding work in a bigger city. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very interested to see what they'll do, because as we've talked about, the grants, in my opinion, are great. Uh, make students come out with less student debt, make them immediately be able to spend the money they make. They can buy a car, they can buy a house, they can invest, but without the jobs to back that up, 
we're still going to have a brain drain. We're still going to create educated people that have to leave Newfoundland to find work. Except now you've paid for them to leave. Exactly. Now so. we've paid to educate them, and they'll leave. You so know? I actually had a question about about the actual idea of making these non-repayable grants and getting rid of loans entirely. Um, do you think that's a good idea? Because I, I thought maybe it would be interesting to have non-repayable grants for the people who are in the most financial need, and then pe maybe people on the next tier after a certain, let's say, income cutoff, um, they have like maybe tax-free loans or loans that interest-free loans, I guess. Or where you just have a loan and then you you get the money and then you have and you pay it back over time, um, and then have regular loans for people with the next bracket, I guess. And I, I was going to sum suggest something similar to that. My idea was not, um, you know, give them tax free or something like that, but people in a low enough income bracket, 100% of their tuition is covered by grants. People in the middle tier, maybe 60% is covered by grants, but still 40% loans. Uh, then in the highest tier, make it like 60 40 the other way around, something like that. Um, I saw a lot of people commenting on, I think it was the CTV News website, that. Uh, we're, we're basically, if, it, if it's going to be uh, like a merit-based, like an academic-based grant system, then we'll be giving money to the wealthy. Yeah, I saw that. That was, that was my next point, actually. And I've, that I've seen is that criticism. not a good thing, necessarily. Like, we want to spread the money out almost in like kind of a socialist way, like to the people that need it more should yeah. be eligible mm -hmm. for more, you know? Well, like the whole argument behind these tuition assistance programs was that education is supposed to be the great equalizer that makes the poor middle class, makes the middle class rich, and makes uh, makes the capitalist system not an oligarchy because, you know, you go back to the 20s, and if you had money, you were able to afford to go to good schools, you were able to afford to get hooked up with good jobs, and so if you were rich, you stayed rich, if you were poor, you stayed poor. And in these situations, like this was what meant to undercut that if you make it yeah merit based where you can still afford to go to private school and you can still afford to say have you know you can still afford to have people tutor you on in class or you can afford to spend your nights doing homework instead of cooking for your kid because you're a single or, you're in a single parent household and your mom has to work at night like or as i had to do having to go to work at walmart you yeah, know, I worked two and a half years during my undergrad at the local Walmart just to pay my tuition. I, like, I was lucky enough school. to come through debt-free because of getting decent jobs through an undergrad. But so many of my friends got an undergrad in Newfoundland, where it's the cheapest tuition in the country, and still owed forty or fifty thousand dollars for their undergrad by the time they were done. Mm -hmm. So, I saw I saw one comment online that I think, in my opinion, was the best idea for this for the the you know for this system to actually start running and it was you it's all grants but you only have to pay back based on how you did in your courses so if you get people that like I, I saw this in first year university I'm sure you guys did as well people that get a big loan and then just party the entire first year away and then fail out right mm -hmm. do we necessarily want to make their first year free or even offset it with grants if they're just gonna party and not actually contribute so what I saw online was you pay back based on how well you did in courses so if you fail a course you have to pay the full amount for the course but if you get a 90 you only have to pay a small fraction that sounds like an anxiety that's statistically significant and the amount of infrastructure you have to build around that would cost more than just giving out the money it's it's like when people try to like make welfare harder and harder to get to like avoid people who are scamming it when like they spend more money trying to catch people scamming welfare then they would actually save by just giving everybody welfare, not worrying about it. Yeah. Um, I like my. I, I have a. I have a solution myself too, which is that. Um, you see, there's this really, really rich country that I've heard of. It's called Germany, <laughs> and nobody pays to go to university there well, at all. That's the way in most of Western <laughs> Europe, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I saw comments online where it was like, Canada is such a young country. Look at any of the well-established countries, and nobody pays for higher education. It's all completely paid for by the government. So we need to move forward and become one of these revolutionary, like, new countries. Yeah. They're, ex they're extremely wealthy. Like, they, they became extremely wealthy because they have extremely high educated people. And if, my, if Newfoundland was just like, we're going to be the first province to do free free tuition, 
I think that that would be actually like amazing for a tiny little island. First of all, you'd have gentrification in like cities like St. John like crazy, right? Oh, the, the, <laughs> like, the population of the province would boom because of that. Like yeah. right now, we're sitting at roughly the population of London, Ontario, right? It's about 450,000 people. Mm -hmm. But you introduce free tu tuition, and I can easily see that bumping quite significantly in the next couple of years. Yeah. The only problem with making the contrast, though, between Canada and provinces in Canada and Western or, you know, European countries, I guess, is that one, one that comes to mind when you say free education is Sweden. And so sw and that's really great and everything, but then you, when you look under the surface and talk to people who are actually from Sweden, you realize that the average student graduating from, Sweden, from a Swedish university even though they didn't have to pay, um, is still on the order of, I guess, Canadian or U.S. dollars, but $15,000 in debt because rent is so high there and living expenses are so high in this country and the fact that the, the population of the country, you can only get free education and access to these things if you have Swedish citizenship, which you can't get if you're a refugee, which you, you have to, basically it's, it's an exclusive thing to have. So there's a subpopulation in the country. That's all for this week. If you want to send us some feedback or if you want to come on the show yourself, email us at gradcastradio at gmail.com. Be sure to hook us up on social media. On Twitter, we're at Gradcast Radio, and look up Gradcast Radio also on Facebook. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, the podcast is located at gradcast.podbean.com, and it's on iTunes. And while you're there, why don't you leave us a review? It really helps us out. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>